Good morning, everybody. Today is April 10th, 2014, and I call the Economic Development Commission meeting to order. Uh, did everybody get a chance to review the minutes and any comments, questions, or changes they'd like to make? Mark, can you hold one minute, please? Oh, I'm not can you start again? Nancy, go ahead. I can promise that. <laughs> well, I see. They want to, re they want to record it. Oh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I'm not going to be able to do that. Yeah. 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 That's all I know. I mean, he said everything was agreed to except a couple of little e legal things. He said that in August, too. He did. <laughs> His property. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's take it for what it's worth. <laughs> right, right. That's right. I, I know nothing then. I wonder if he's. Okay, once again, good morning. Today is April 10th, 2014. I'd like to call the Economic Development Commission meeting to order. Are there any comments or questions on the minutes, changes? If not, do we have a motion to, for approval of the minutes? So moved. Second? Second. Yep. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Reports. Nancy, well, would you like to go first this time? Who? I'm Sarah. I went last time, last month. She gets to be first this month. Okay. Then we'll let the Sims Main Street partners go ahead. Sarah, well, go ahead. I didn't even get my coffee. Oh, there you go. Diana. Okay, um, just a couple of things. Hockey wrapped up last week. It was the Junior Nationals. It was the first year that this was in Sims We have it again for next year. Um, I think it was overall successful. There were a couple of issues. I mean, having this many players, um, this many teams in Sims Ray, and it was the older, it was the, the high school <coughs> kids this year. So um, I do think that there were a couple of snags, a couple of issues with some of the businesses that we've got to go back um, and revisit how we're going to work that out. You know, just as an example, I think the inn, um, you know, did a really competitive pricing, but at the same time had several big events going on. and had a bunch of teams there and at one point, you know, the 30 young men um, that want to hang out in yeah. the lobby, you know, there, there were some, there were some um, things that I think we've got to revisit uh, to make it even smoother for next time. But I, again, overall, I think it was very successful. Uh, this ended up being great for uh, the restaurants, not as great for the retailers, and I think that we'll work on trying to, um, Again, focus a little bit more on that for next year, but I think for this year it was a really nice solid base um, and, and the tournament was very successful. Uh, May is bike month and you'll be hearing from the bike committee of which um, I've been sitting on and they'll talk to you about some of the efforts they're doing. Um, we have every year, twice a year, we do the Discover Simsray section. It comes out in the Hartford Current. It's a piece that's focused only on Simsray. Main Street has had a long-standing partnership with The Current. Um, this first edition will come out May 15th. Um, some of the stories that we're focusing on um, this year, are, or I'm sorry, for this month, um, are going to be the May's Bike Month, and we're going to wrap in the triathlon because it's only a couple days before the triathlon. We'll focus more on getting community support, people from the community out to um, 
participate and to you know hopefully stop by towards the end of the race and, and see the runners come in and cheer them on. Um, and also focus on, you know, we've been working on the business outreach committee to um, put some vending down there. Kane will be down there um, from 1230 to 230 at the finish line, surveying hot dogs and hamburgers and, and things to the spectators and, and what have you. Um, and we're working on getting ice cream. Um, we've asked John Dark Angelo, but I know his schedule's been a little bit tight, so I have not heard back from him yet, but we anticipate that we'll have ice cream as <laughs> well. Um, <clears throat> we are also going to focus on the summer events at the Performing Arts Center. We, uh, we always do a story on that, on how Simsbury is a destination, and so we've done that, you know, uh, in years past, uh, last year, the year before, etc. So we'll be focused on that as well. Um, we're going to do an article on the Simsbury Farmers Market, which kicks off June nineteenth. It runs sixteen weeks through October second. Um, and just a reminder, I mean, that really is a, a big tourism and residential draw. Uh, it promotes some of the best things uh, you know, our agritourism, which is uh, you know, an industry I think that Century is very proud of, um, that generates economic development. It draws hundreds of people every week. Um, we have themed events. We have entertainment. We allow for community organizations, um, such as the Paw Meadow and uh, the Century Theaters Guild and, and a lot of kids' events to come through. Um, so again, that's 16 weeks. Um, Talcott Mountain is coming up, as I mentioned, with the Performing Arts Center. Um, we do the packages, uh, both off-site and on-site, for lodging and also if you want to pick something up to eat, we make it as easy as possible. Um, and then we handle the vending on-site for the Talcott Mountain, not for the other three concerts, although we've, we've worked with um, Coplick and, and uh, Premier and all those guys in the past as well. Um, <coughs> In addition to the Economic Development Commission, um, I believe Hiram will be here, although I'm guessing that's not his purse, to talk about the Economic <laughs> Development <laughs> Task Force. I just noticed that song. That's usually where he says, the Economic Development Task Force. Um, I'm the liaison to tourism, and I know that they've been engaged, um, and they have a focus on heritage tourism, which has always been Main Street's focus, I think is incredibly important, um, because it's, it's we're authentic. We're not like Disneyland, and so uh, the type of tourist dollars, as I think Nancy can attest, that the majority of Connecticut tourism dollars come from friends and family that stay and visit relatives that are living in Connecticut. Um, I'm on the bike committee, the business committee of the triathlon, uh, the innovation core committee, um, and that committee meets next week. If anyone's interested, um, from the town, I know Lisa Karam from the Century Public Library and Hiram Peck um, from, from the town side uh, both sit on that committee as well as myself, the Historical Society and the schools. Um, but this is a really fantastic committee. I think what we're doing is uh, a multi-generational multi approach to innovation, entrepreneurship. Um, our focus right now, there's been talk with, you know, we have such a fantastic uh, business resource center at the library. Um, and so there's been talk about really um, they have all the great bones of making it kind of like a um, small business incubator space, you know, because there are people that work from home um, that might want to not meet at their home when they're talking to clients or what have you, and also have certain technology, they have scanners, printers, copiers, fax, etc., etc., um, private space. So really packaging that together to show people that you can do all of these things at the library, and so we're working with them. Um, to focus on what's something that they're currently doing, but to really market it and expand it to, to try to be a, a true small business incubator space um, for entrepreneurs and small businesses. Um, I'm on the Enos, which just uh, convened the Enos, Enos Senior Center Subcommittee. And then even though it's not till August, and I know people are gonna be talking about their events, um, the Taste in Sims rate, is coming up again. It's August 28th. That is our premier event. We have over 400 people from all over, not just Simsbury, but uh, throughout the state of Connecticut and into Massachusetts and sometimes New York we've gotten uh, that will come and sample the best offerings that both Simsbury and the Greater Hartford has to offer. Um, it's held at the Riverview, which is a major taxpayer, you know, to showcase what the Riverview can do as well. Um, and that's coming up August 28th. Thank you. Um, did the boss did the Globe article come out yet? April thirtieth. Okay. April thirtieth, and I I will be waiting with me that as well. I have no idea, you know. Again, with the travel itinerary, I know she visited certain places, but it'll be really interesting to see um, what the focus is on this year. Okay. Comments, question. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a busy season. <laughs> Nancy. Comment. <laughs> 
A, a first and quick brief overview. April 24th seems to be a huge day in the state and obviously Simsbury. The convention, uh, Connecticut Convention Conference on Tourism is the 24th and it runs until five o'clock. There are still openings if anybody would like to come downtown and be a part of the action. You can still leave there at five or do not do the entire end of their ending reception and come here and go to the Meadows, if you wish. And if, if in fact, that's not what you have signed up for, I may see you at the Ellsworth Center for the opening lecture for the One Room Schoolhouse Bus Tour, which is the 26th. So it's busy, busy, busy day. There are an awful lot of speakers at the um, tourism conference. They will be unveiling the new state brand identity, TV campaign, and other ideas. It seems that Adams and Knight was chosen this year, and they happen to be in Avon, very close to the Simsbury line, just in case people need proximity. Um, they did another study from Boston, New York, New Jersey, and all over the state of Connecticut. What do you think of Connecticut? Where is Connecticut? They put up, I was just at a meeting yesterday, put up on the screen the map of Connecticut, and 95% of everybody that said anything was the only thing in Connecticut is I-95, and Mystic, and the casinos. And so Adam, with that in mind, Adams and Knight has come up with a brand new campaign that they're gonna be kicking off, hopefully with the governor, at something like 8.30 in the morning on the 24th. And it is diverse possibilities. It, it'll be very interesting. Sarah, don't laugh. <clears throat> but their, their 15 spot splashes include relax and active, historic and contemporary, natural and cultural, saying that there are more things than just driving through the state to get from one part of the east to the other. And you can delve into at least you know the center and beyond the state and get things. So they showed some of the clips. One is find your zen next to your zip, and then there's a quiet vineyard, and then there's a zip line. Things to get people active. The um, focus groups that came out thought those things were really cute. It'll be interesting to see what happens. And in May, you'll probably be seeing them on television. And they will be in the Greater New York Market, New Jersey, and <coughs> pardon me, downstate a bit. Uh, we were also told that if we all continue to cross our fingers, the Appropriations Committee will be giving $12 million to the state tourism and the 500000 to each one of the regional tourism districts to continue marketing. Of course, the state would like to have us try to do this diverse possibility marketing ourselves. It will be a little bit more difficult, but we will be able to tailor both sides of those two things that are in our area. So. I'm working with the Regional Tourism Committee Marketing Committee to attempt to try to do that <coughs> with Farmington Valley Pictures. Because there aren't very many Farmington Valley Pictures in their presentation. So it is, it is very nice that she is in Avon and very close by so I can go kind of tell her with the second set maybe it'd be nice to put something in. Performing Arts Center, Hillstead Museum, some of the real big treasures that the Valley owns that, that right there are not in state marketing. So that ought to be interesting. Um, I don't know if any of you have read anything about Discover New England. I don't know if you remember that we had been left out for years. Well, this year it is May 19th to 21st, and it's being held at the Mystic Marriott. And Connecticut, being its host, is going all out on things Connecticut. So I do have a question for you. Do you know who wrote the very first cookbook? Mm -hmm. Amelia Simmons, 1796, called American Cookery. And they're going to be handing that out to everybody that comes to Discover New England, which ought to be cute. They are doing all things Connecticut. The problem is they really couldn't take any recipes out of this book because I don't think anybody would be into ox hearts and the other recipes that were there, <laughs> including other interesting pot pies. But, but they, they have three chefs that are trying to make a modern spin on some of those and they are um, giving out the cookbook. So people sitting around the Tourism Advisory Committee yesterday asked if there would be extra copies so at least we could have one to show off to everybody. Other than that, um, 
I think the last official meeting of the triathlon, tri Sinsbury was yesterday. And we all have our final projects to do. So we're firming up the registration committee and, and who's going to do the body marking. And one of the things that was brought up was that it was very important to try to get as many people from the public in at the end to come see what's happening afterwards to cheer the people on when they go through the finish line. So I guess Sarah's helping work on that and we're all gonna try to get people out there to do that. Um, last but not least, our 20th anniversary gala is May 31st and information has been out. If anybody's interested and you don't have a save the date or an invitation, let me know. Questions? Mm -hmm. Unfounded. Oh. Bell Terrace. It's called a night at the bell. Uh, Nancy, just one thing it may sound a little superficial. I love but, superficial. Um, for the second time, I don't know if you were involved 10 years ago with the basketball championships. You think that has probably raised the profile a great deal. Sports Illustrated, 21 million people watched the men's championship game. It, would this potentially raise the level, at least initially, in tourism, do you think? Yes. Yes, they're actually saying so. I mean, apparently the crowds are getting to buy T-shirts are incredible. Yeah. I think there'll be interesting revenue from that. Tough to follow. Im Im <laughs> Im impossible to chart. <clears throat> impossible to chart, but I, I would venture a guess that some of the marketing that will come out in the future will have basketball. I would think of so. Of course, there are a couple of core committees trying to get things back here again <coughs> so that well, we can have something else in Hartford. And just the University of Connecticut, um, they, they do a very good job in both, it's a big fundraising boost for them, yeah. for, their, for the school, which yeah. helps everybody. Can you know, um, it, yeah, it, go, it went out the, the next morning because yeah. as an alumni, you get it like instantly. Um, so they raise it, they do it for fundraising for the for the state of Connecticut, and they also do it to raise the profile of the University of Connecticut, which in turn helps the state. Yeah. Uh, I know that friends are involved, not you got but fundraising. You get you can chart the success of the athletic teams and the raising and of endowment dollars. Just oh, absolutely, one -to -one. which is why the minute something like the double championship, well, actually after the men's. You get a letter after the women's. You got a, you know, all the funders got a letter. So they, they definitely take advantage of that. And all the ticket holders. Yeah, good shame. All the ticket holders. So we got letters. Yeah. So we'll see. You know, the Convention and Sports Bureau is, from what I can tell, already talking about it. So I don't know what they can do about it. But Was there any experience ten years ago when the same thing happened? I don't know. I don't know. Stay tuned. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have this uh, also this morning. It's the Great Bicycle Advisory Committee, and uh, uh, Moody will make the presentation. Yeah, actually, uh, myself and uh, Larry Lenox is the director of Sense of Right. Yeah, Diane and I are both uh, committee members. Diana chairs the uh, steering committee. Could you just state your name once again for the? I'm Larry Lenox. Um, Director of Simsbury Free Bike. Um, I'm a retired transportation professional, I have 40 years experience uh, working for companies like Federal Express, Roadway Express. I'm a former Army helicopter pilot, and now I direct that program, the day-to-day -day operation. So I've been involved in transportation my entire life. Um, <clears throat> Diana and her husband, Jim, put this presentation together over the winter, uh, spending many, many hours of research uh, uh, showing what the economic opportunities are for bicycling. And that's our target market, and we're hoping it'll be your target market as well. So, Diane. <coughs> <laughs> you're plugged in, you're plugged in. Oh, I'm not plugged in, I'm so sorry. Give us, give us a chance. Yeah. 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 Um, Simsbury Free Bike started in 2010 um, with bicycles that were left over from the town acquired from the police department. And since then we've grown to uh, an organization that's the largest bike share program in Connecticut. We have 50 bikes now in 10 11 locations in six towns. And there's no other uh, bike sharing program that I'm aware of anywhere that has that many uh, locations outside of a single uh, municipality. 
And we've learned quite a bit in the last few years about uh, the economics of bicycling. And that's what we're going to try to demonstrate to you today, the importance of uh, a bicycle-friendly community and how that contributes economically to the communities. Are you ready? I apologize here. We've, we've done this twice this week, and it's come up perfectly, so just see. There we go. So the key points here is that, uh, <coughs> you know, bicycling uh, <coughs> has a pretty large economic impact. Um, Pretty much everybody rides, not just adults, but uh, children, families. Um, we've, we see a lot of uh, day visits from other towns coming up on our bike trail. Uh, we've seen some increase in activities at the shops and stuff with people stopping in. The more friendly you make our businesses for bicyclists, the more economic impact it's going to have favorably on our merchants. Um, <clears throat> Simsbury has been certified by the League of American Bicyclists as a bicycle friendly community. Very, very difficult process to be recognized as a bicycle friendly community. We are, the, <clears throat> there are so many communities out there that envy us. They want to be, want to be Simsburys. Many of the towns in the valley now are trying to become bike friendly like we are and going through the application process. Very difficult. There's only two towns in Connecticut that have been successful, us in South Windsor. Um, <clears throat> So we want to try to promote a bicycle-friendly culture and a safe place to ride. Uh, bicycling contributes billions of dollars to the economy. Uh, annual sales, $7.3 billion. Uh, mostly, uh, most of the bikes are sold at small shops like our own bicycle seller, which is a family-owned business, which is what we want. We'd rather see bikes sold in, in a local business than from Walmart or Kmart. And that's where most of the bikes are sold. Uh, generally speaking, uh, we find that there's uh, about 39 million riders, uh, about 5 million avid riders. I'm an avid rider. I ride 10,000 miles a year. And there's a large group of people who ride to work every day. There's a lot of people who ride recreationally every day. And those people come to Simsbury all the time. Uh, and <clears throat> what's good about it, too, is they, generally these people have deep pockets. The average revenue, the average income for these folks is $75,000 or greater. And there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> people out there now, young Americans, who are more interested in bicycling than owning cars. Um, next one, Dave. So we want to know who rides. <clears throat> um, not just the guys in the spandex, you, know, you see them on the roads all the time, but women ride and uh, women and children ride. Uh, you'll find men and men and children riding all the time. Um, interesting enough, uh, we found, based on the waiver information that we uh, took from uh, participants in our bike sharing program, that more than half of the people using our bikes are women, actually 65%. And it runs contrary to what you'd normally would think. The studies that I've seen typically show a ratio of two to one or three to one men. But over 65% of our, the people using our bicycles are women. 65%, that's a big number. Um, so people, um, people ride to, what's that? Oh, that's Audrey Hepburn. Okay, so we have famous people that ride too. Uh, one particular person that you probably aren't aware of who was an avid cyclist was Albert Einstein. And he even said that he uh, first thought of his theory of relativity when he was riding his bicycle. So it's a very soothing uh, experience, as you all know. It's very relaxing. If you ever get stressed out, go for a bike ride. You usually feel better when you're done. Um, and I might add, um, we all know cliff bars, correct? Well, the, the guy who invented cliff bars, he invented them literally riding his bicycle because he didn't have any food. And so he was trying to figure out what's the easiest way to get food so clip bars were actually discovered on a bicycle as well so we're talking about everybody rides um, and i do mean everybody even the handicapped people ride. You'll see them out on the trail. We, we actually have uh, recumbent bicycles at our shop that are designed specifically for people with handicaps. We have rides out of there for folks with multiple sclerosis also with people, uh, returning veterans <coughs> who have lost mobility uh, in a war. So it, it does appeal to a broad spectrum of business. That's why it's so important economically, because you know it's a shotgun effect. There are many, many different people out there that you can appeal to, not just a, a narrow group of, say, golfers. We're talking about everybody. 
Uh, and it, it's a lifestyle that does attract people. And I've, I can't tell you how many friends that I've made on the trail. I can't tell you uh, how often you see people smiling and being happy. It's a very pleasant experience. I haven't met anybody out there uh, <clears throat> that I know of um, that's ever been angry. I mean, if you look at the economic Im impact, again, um, I don't know if anybody knows Kip Bergstrom. He's like the deputy commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development. He did uh, give a presentation at the uh, annual meeting of Connecticut <coughs> Bike Walk, which we all went to in November. <clears throat> and what's important about what he said, I'll read it to you, um, is that uh, the group of people in the 25 to 35 year old age group um, prefer places that have a bikeable and walkable uh, opportunities. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we're in competition with other towns and cities in America for them. Okay, they generally now uh, are much more interested in that type of culture than they are the auto culture, what we grew up in. So if you, if you have those sorts of resources, which we have here in town, we have wonderful resources. I mean, 32% of our land is open space. We have a bike path. We have <clears throat> Metacomet Trail. We have the Farmington River. Those are the things that appeal to these people and to many, many people. And we need to you know, really exploit that and, and really push that. And, and to reinforce that, too, it really has become very competitive. So um, we are in competition with other towns. And if you look at the, our own, uh, the results of our own um, study that was done in October, okay, by the consulting firm, I quote them, um, <clears throat> development opportunities capitalizing on Simsbury's recreational assets, the rail trail and the Farmington River to create a sports complex and or retail stores catering to fishing, <coughs> hiking, and biking. That's where we're going to be able to get our dollars. And that's what they, I, I totally agree with them. We may not be able to find a large, uh, organization to move into the Hartford. The only way we're going to get that money back is in bits and pieces. And I think if we can make ourselves more and more attractive, okay, as an eco uh, recreational destination, we're going to realize uh, a lot of benefits from that. Um, and again, to reinforce that, we are all familiar with the Fairweather study. We uh, got this information from the Fairweather study, who also uh, really indicated that we had a high potential to be a recreational destination, which I believe also, um, Sarah, doesn't it say that on the, on the tri, the tri brochure? Yes. That we're yeah. <coughs> it's actually been incorporated to many different themes. Um, so. we, we really already are a destination where people visit. We just haven't been able to track that. And we haven't been able to pull those people in and, and realize the economic benefits from having them come here. They come in large groups. I mean, you're going to go out on the bike trail this weekend. It's going to be in the 60s. And you'll see <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of people out there. We need to get those people to spend money in Simsbury. Um, <clears throat> cyclists spend $46.9 billion annually, <clears throat> including meals, transportation, lodging, gifts, etc. cetera. Um, 133 billion spillover effects on all related activities. So when you're bike friendly, people come to your town because it's safe to ride. It's attractive. We have a beautiful downtown. We have tremendous uh, assets, it's particularly when you go out west. We have, uh, we're the first town in, in Connecticut to have sheroes. I don't know if you know what those are, those symbols on the road of a bicyclist. We're the first town to have those. We have 16.6 .6 mile loop nobody even knows about. We have, nine different venues in town that are suitable for uh, mountain biking with 40 trails, 30 miles, um, almost 3,000 acres of mountain biking that, uh, uh, venues that nobody knows about. You look at some of the places where bicycling has had a significant effect uh, on the economies and places you would never even think. I mean, let's look at Minnesota. Minnesota's the coldest place in the world. But look at how much revenue they've generated from bicycling. Uh, I remember reading some articles about uh, old mining towns out west and logging towns, you know, and, and their culture it was all built around those industries and they collapsed and many of them came up with ideas and and making themselves a bicycle destination because they had roads and paths out in the woods and, you know, people came. They were able to, you know, uh, 
promote that. And there's, there's ways of doing that. There are many, many different organizations that bicyclists belong to that we need to discuss. Um, but again, bicycle friendly does attract tourists. Um, We've had rides here in town where people have come from other places just to stop in Simsbury. And we had an EMS ride last year where we had 150 riders that came from Portland, uh, Maine, on their way uh, to <laughs> Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and they stopped here. We had a ride uh, a couple years before that, uh, a Tour de Vida ride, where we had 400 people uh, uh, at the Performing Arts Center that spent the night. Uh, and we've had the Calhoun ride. We've had many different rides, okay? And we, we need to get more of those and get more people to visit us. Um, Let's take a look at uh, what so, so again to reinforce that what we're saying is it attracts tourism and adventure cycling is a very important uh, organization because avid cyclists go to this website it's sort of like the from of bicycling so if they're looking for a destination to go to they go to adventure cycling and I might uh, Ag that South Windsor is on there. We are not on there yet, but actually Mary and I are working on that so that Sinsbury can get on that website. And so is Windsor Locks. I mean, who would ever imagine Windsor Locks as being a bicycle destination? How do you get on that website? Well, what? that's what we're working on. And we're working on also we're working on that. the um, National Mountain Biking Association. Okay, that's another organization we want to uh, uh, have know about us. There are many. Okay, well, we just haven't looked at that yet, and it's unfortunate. That, that, that at least we've recognized the fact that they're out there, and that's a way to uh, a ways to uh, an end. Um, we have waivers that our guests uh, use, our users uh, fill out uh, when they uh, use a bicycle, a sensory free bike, and uh, we've been able to abstract some uh, demographical information uh, from those. And Diana and her husband. Uh, put this whole presentation together and also did a lot of research based on the demographics of our users. Just to give you an idea, okay, and this is just for Simsbury, of course we have locations in other towns that aren't rolled into this, but in Simsbury itself, for the period of the time study that we did, we had 368 people that were out of towners use our bikes, okay? Out of that, uh, 168 of them came from Connecticut towns. 188 came from other states and there's a representation, each dot on there has a number on it, how many people from these states actually use the Sims 3 free bikes. And same thing over here in the towns, you can see the valley's loaded up pretty good, but we've had people from the coast as well that found out about us and came up here to use our bikes. Uh, people, you know, I've had run into people on the trail from Holland, okay, I've run into people from Russia. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And a lot of those folks obviously came from the Simsbury Inn. We did do some uh, demographical research too on age groups, on women versus men, uh, and found out a lot of things that were very surprising. As I mentioned before how many women used the bicycles. Um, and also again to reinforce that, uh, Kip uh, Burson study, who uh, his demographics was from the 25 to 34 year olds. Ours showed the same thing whenever we we uh, did our study on all waivers, so the same age group. And we did have a large group of people, too, that were 45 to 55, much more than I thought. And those are the folks that usually have the deepest pockets. Uh, so if you look at some of the streets in various parts of the country, and I can't read that from here, but um, basically, if you create an area that's bicycle friendly for visitors to, to uh, uh, frequent, You'll increase business dramatically because bicyclists don't move through your town at 40 miles an hour. They're going to absorb more at 10 miles an hour. And, and we want to be able to give those people opportunities to stop into businesses by offering racks, by offering services for the bicyclist. And we haven't been able to really pair very well with business as, our, as, our organiza as an organization. But we're, you know, what? Want to add something? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, again, to reinforce that, is um, one of the things that we're working on, too, is more bike lanes. And what this is saying is that when these towns put in more bicycle lanes, what happened is the cyclists actually spent more time. So when they're spending more time, they're actually spending um, more money per month. And if you make safe routes <clears throat> for your... Um your local folks to use to get into town, okay, that behooves you. Instead of putting 10 gallons of gas in your car to drive 
outside of town, they'll come into town to buy perishables. What? I'll, I'll ask that. That was one of my questions that I had, and I, I know this has been brought up by Ferg in the past. Uh, and I agree with all of what you're saying, and, and I think it's very important. Uh, but in, so even though we're bike friendly, in Simsbury, it's very linear. It's one path. And, and we have a summer house. My family, all summer, don't use a car. They'll go five miles to run errands on bikes. I am never on my bike in this town because I live in an area that doesn't allow me to get on a safe route, nor my kids who go to work and everything on bikes in the summer are never on them here because we don't have those uh, paths that connect to areas and what you just said right there, I was going to bring that up, what you just said right there, I think to help the central business district uh, going east-west as opposed to one north-south uh, would help that aspect of it. And I don't, you know, it takes money, but I've been in communities where if you have those routes, if you have those safe routes, you will get numerous people to use bikes that I bet do not use them now. I being one of them, my family being one of them. They use it all summer long, <coughs> hardly ever here. We're addressing that, uh, as a matter of fact, um, on the budget, for fiscal year uh, 2015, we're hoping to get uh, a resurfacing done of the river trail. There's places people don't even know exist, uh, honestly. Nobody knows that we have nine venues for mountain biking. Nobody realizes we have a Sharrows route. Don't even know where it is. So we're working on getting signage. We're working on interconnectivity of all the routes. And uh, that's a process that we're embracing and we hope to get maps out there available to everybody both online uh, and available in printed form but we need uh, the local government we need businesses to help us in our endeavors and that's why we're giving you this presentation right now there are routes that are safe but you don't know about them uh, <clears throat> actually uh we said this on our advisory committee lisa would you like to add anything to that i just say that um our public works department is also involved in this and we are looking at doing a master plan for connectivity uh we've been in contact with latimer lane we would like that east west <coughs> connectivity to the trail um on latimer lane uh, as you know we just completed owens brook that was a took a look at when we first uh, put it forward, the Board of Finance did not see the economic value in it and cut it from our budget. We, it took us three years to get it passed. It was taken out again, and Mary and I put it back in. Um, and so this is a great way to help promote the economic value of it. And then we saw that reinforced with the charrette. When the, we did the charrette, one of the things they said we need to work on uh, are those east-west connections that you pointed out there. You're exactly right. And they felt that that was a huge generator of economic value activity, the connectivity, and also just from the marketing setting, when we talked about um, high skill technology companies that want to come to Sinsbury, they're looking for quality of life, and one of those are connectivity, a walkability. Well, for example, the uh, project that's going into the Powder Forest, they tried to get as close as they could. They have a workforce group, and it's housing, and they're right on Stratton Brook, but their property doesn't go all the way down to the bus uh, stop and the bike path and one of the things that were pointed out when they presented to us uh, was there's what was it a uh, 500 yards or 400 yards between where their property ends and the uh, hot meadow intersection with Stratton Brook where a bike path in that entire area it, that's just an example a small one which they could probably somehow that, that is a share road route by the way Strattonbrook <clears throat> and the share road route starts there and goes all the way up um, over Bushy Hill Road down the other side and, and out to, uh, to uh, town farms um, and then right on Holcomb and then uh, but you don't know about it so we're going to sign it as a matter of fact there's going to be signs going in soon um, at the intersection of Town Forest Road and uh, Strattonbrook that show people how to get to town. As a matter of fact, you can get safely from uh, uh, West Mountain Road to the center of town by just going through uh, the bike path, which we're going to uh, resurface, and over through Strattonbrook Park, and you'll end up at the high school. And then um, you can... Those are the 
connections that those are the connections that nobody knows about right uh, nobody even knows that there's a bike trail there so we're addressing that with signage and you'll see a lot more signage this year uh, I don't have any examples to show you but but take take my word for it you'll see a lot of that this year and we'll continue to do it as we go along and thank you that was a great question really that was uh, In terms of walkability and connectivity, in terms of projects and how to make those things happen. So it's becoming part of the culture in terms of um, what this community needs and, and the recognition that it is economic development. It's not just lovely, which it also is. It's, it's a also, lifestyle, too, that helps yeah. bring in other Correct. businesses yes. that may be more compatible with what That's we exactly are looking right. for. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Just give me a second to talk about women in bicycling. I know I mentioned the fact that we, we recognize that 65 percent of our users are women, which runs contrary to what you normally would think. The studies I've seen say two to one or three to one men, but that's not the case. And what's really important about that is that 85 percent figure right there. 85 percent of all purchases made in this country are made by women. So it's, it behooves us to target that market. And they're always looking for safe places to ride. That's why they come to Simsbury, because it's a safe place to ride. And shop. And shop. How about shoes or bicycles? Pocketbooks. <laughs> 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 Anything they want to buy. You know. um, so let me just, Philadelphia introduced bike lanes, and the female ridership went up 276%. <laughs> there were large increases in Louisiana and, and, and New Orleans, too. Any city that does that, okay, attracts <laughs> women. And that, like I said, they spend all the money. <coughs> And that's why, you know, last summer I took a look, I, I grabbed off a stack of waivers and I said, let's let me look at this for a minute. And I noticed that the users were women. And I looked at the makeup of our Simsbury bike fleet. And there's, there's the Jay Foster's ice cream pipe, which I created this winter just for them. And I noticed that, you know, we didn't have enough lady-specific bikes out there. So I re-engineered the whole fleet. And I got the step through frames and baskets. And I made sure at least half of our bikes appealed to women. And it worked. Um, so, you know, we're always looking at that. Uh, it's always important to, to do studies and, and get data. And that's one thing we lack. We don't have a lot of data. <clears throat> um, what else can I say? About bike-friendly communities again, um, we are one. And um, we're trying to uh, increase certain areas, okay? We're working to go to the silver level. It's increasingly difficult to go from bronze to silver to gold to platinum. Extremely hard. You have to have higher percentages of each category. Encouragement, okay, that's one big thing. <clears throat> We've noticed that we never really got a good buy-in from businesses in this town, okay? And that's where we're lacking in, in becoming bike friendly. Uh, uh, it's so hard to, to get somebody to put a bike rack in front of their place. Why? You know, well, they, I don't know why. Uh, this is mostly property owners, not business managers, or it's property owners. They just don't want to spend it. So we've actually purchased, you know, with our our tiny little budget bike racks, for, you know, to give to people when we put bikes out. Uh, have you thought, I mean, as a local business person, have you thought of doing some sort of business sponsorship of bike racks so we could put some pressure on the landlords who own the buildings and having some sort of designation like a sticker or a sign in our window that we're a bike friendly business as some sort of advertisement to connect the on your website that these 20 businesses are bike friendly businesses and you know, we've got some sort of designation that we can put a sticker in our window, like we're a booster club supporter for the football team or whatever. Absolutely. And um, we could support and sponsor the bike racks as a business and then put pressure on the landlords to allow us to put them on the property. We're, we're getting to some of that right now. Okay. Good question. Um, so a bike friendly business district. We certainly have one. Our main street is definitely a bicycle friendly business district. We, we re-engineered the whole street. Um, but have we gone to businesses to ask them to help us out? No, really haven't. We've tried to get some of these property owners, management companies to do things, but it's a deaf ear. I mean, they don't even return our phone calls. So little by little, you know, we make progress. Um, what? Um, I'm, I, you know, um, again, to reinforce that, the, the whole purpose of this economic development presentation, we wanted to start with the commission. And then we were moving forward to do a presentation to the chamber, to Main Street, to the Rotary, to get the message out. Because people really don't know. So it's really our job 
as the uh, Stream Security Pedestrian Advisory uh, Committee to really let those businesses know their potential um, to have a bicycle for the community. So we're trying to educate them. So this is this is our first start right here and to go forward. And so uh, we're looking for your help. We're looking for uh, everybody in the town's help. We're looking for the business's help. So. Uh, now we have, they're out there already. There's people on bikes out there already. We just need to cultivate them a little bit more than what we've done. Um, but in sales do increase. I mean, there's been so many studies done that show you what the, the, the huge advantages of being a bike-friendly Main Street means. People come back time and again. I know, personally, I, I buy all my perishables usually on a bike. You know, I'll do one big shopping spree, and then I'll usually ride my bike and pick up other things all the time. And I stay in town. I buy locally. And that's what we want to promote. Right now, we're training kids. Okay, we trained 289 third and fourth graders how to ride bikes last year, 80 high school students. So we have to start with them, okay, and eventually it'll grow. Connecticut used to be an insurance capital of the world. I'd like to have you talk about the insurance aspect of these people that come in and ride bikes all through the town. Uh, we always worry about the, the drivers and the, the insurance aspect to them. What about for the bicyclists? Um, I, I, what about for the bicycle? How are they insured, is that what you're saying? Well, are they insured? That's the first are they question. Insured? Um, no. Unless well, they have that, some kind of general that, policy uh, or homeowner's policy or yeah. general uh, waiver. I mean, the, the, is your concern what? about liability with to businesses? Is well, what's, I, what's I think concern? that comes into the equation. Yeah. Uh, than, no more than a pedestrian. Yeah, because you're you're driving on the street. You're bringing your car up on the business. If you fall, I'm your same law that applies to motorists applies to cyclists. So, um, you know, I I don't know that we're really. Um, have the knowledge to answer that question. Lisa might be able to uh, answer that question a little more for you. Probably the I don't even know what the question is, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. I just know there's always the other <laughs> side of the issue, you know? Well, I, I don't think um, that the risk of people getting injured uh, outweighs the potential economic benefit to enhancing our bike friendly. Profile. Just, just I know well, it's just. just yeah, the individual yeah. gets hurt. Well, you, well I sure. mean. <laughs> In, in the so first, in the first few, if it's bike, then take up crocheting. Then <laughs> you're they get the wrong oh, okay. hobby. Right. Six <laughs> hundred thousand yes. users uh, in the first year in Boston's bike share program. Six hundred thousand. One injury where a, a, a bicyclist was hit by a motorist. That's it. That doesn't happen. Uh, if it did, I wouldn't be able to afford the insurance for uh, for the liabilities. It's just well, it's just it's not there. The, the, the injury bike that they have to have. Liability yes, we do. They do as they're loading out the bikes. But I'm, we're talking about a yes. person of, of the general public riding a bike on the street or on the trail. Does that person have insurance in case they run over somebody else? It's pretty much up to them. It's up to the individ individual. But statistically, are there a lot of bicycle accidents between motorists? Mm -hmm. No, it's small. Uh, it's relatively small. And it's up to the individual and whether or not they're going to have a, a rider on their insurance policy to cover them on a bicycle. Uh, but, but statistically, it's a very small number of people. I, I have missed Days. So in terms of, I know it's a slightly different insurance than you were talking about, but there are tremendous health benefits to promoting a healthy community. I have a question. You've mentioned mountain biking several times. Have you looked at the model that is used up in Vermont in the Northeast Kingdom um, for mountain biking <coughs> at all? No, I haven't. Um, we're just getting into that. We didn't even realize we had um, so much mountain biking uh, available uh, to us and, until we started looking at uh, the open spaces and the connectivity. And all of a sudden I realized, uh, and I went out there and actually started counting acreage and uh, came up with almost 3,000 acres that are available for people mountain biking. So no, we haven't even explored that yet. Okay, because the mountain biking in the Northeast Kingdom is centered on a burp. Yeah. And you go and get a trail pass. You purchase a trail pass for your bike that has a registration number on it. You can buy it for a weekend, you can buy it for a season. And the paths are marked just like ski trails, 
So green mm -hmm. for easy, black diamond for difficult. I don't recommend anybody doing the black diamond. <laughs> My son has been on one. <laughs> it's down the side of a mountain. Um, but they, they are trails that are on private property that are maintained by private property owners and they are marked um, and it is very user friendly. They have a mobile app so you can look at where you're going in case you're lost. Um, you can, you know, all the maps are available on your smartphones um, and it's a huge revenue generator. Um, no and question. The money for your pass goes to help with the trail maintenance and the marketing. Mm -hmm. So it's a self-funded program. See, that? those are exactly the kind of ideas. Right. When you we, we had Vermont up there and you saw the amount of revenue that that generated, I mean, nobody even knows that within three quarters of a mile of where we are right now, okay, is the beginning of the Stratton Brook Trail through Stratton Brook Park, okay? That's connected to Town Forest, which is connected to Ethel Walker Woods, which is connected to the Talmetto Woodlot. Okay, those four places right there where you can mountain bike, three quarters of a mile from the town center. 788 acres. I can't tell you how many trails, but lots, and it's right there in town. Well, because I know there's a lot of kids in town who mountain bike and yeah. they go to Massachusetts to do it because they don't know that these things exist here. Um, um, sure. and, and again, um, we are working on that as well. Our advisory committee is working on that. We actually have uh, a gentleman on our committee who is with the CCAP, it's the Connecticut, uh, the Connecticut Cycling Advancement Program. <coughs> and so what it does is it, it encourages kids to be able to bicycle, to mountain bike. And uh, within our silver application, there are certain questions that pertain to mountain biking. So we are addressing that, and we hope also to uh, to increase our, our, our mountain biking cyclists. So to, to wrap things up, <clears throat> you know we have we share the same interests. You know, what can we do together to achieve some goals? Um, you can help us with our bicycle events. You'll see our calendar coming up pretty soon. Uh, we can help each other with tourism. We can get a hold of some of these organizations, okay, that bicyclists are members of, and they get the literature all the time, and um, you know, the, the NIMBO, which is the Mountain Biking Association. Um, there's there's a ton of them, and we need to, you know, be in the forefront. Um, you can help us with our infrastructure uh, uh, improvements. I mean, it, it costs unfortunately two thousand dollars to move a telephone pole. We'd love to have bike lanes coming east and west, but it's just very very expensive. So you know, we need support for our, our budget proposals uh, from everyone. Um, you can help us educating uh, by educating the merchants. There's some great ideas on what to do, but we can't do that ourselves. We need the business community to help us out. Um, and we need to uh, educate, you know, our residents, okay, on what we have available. Um, we're trying to do that in the school system, and hopefully the kids bring that home. We're going to expand our, our pilot program, which was at uh, two, two grammar schools last year, Latimer Lane, and um, which one? Um, uh, Central. And, and, and Central, uh, Tooten Hills. Tooten Hills. We're going to have uh, ride to school events, to ride and walk to school events this year. You'll see that in our calendar. But uh, we're expanding the training program to all fourth grades. Have you made a presentation to SCTV? Um, not yet. Okay. It, it is on our list to do. Um, I did a presentation with Patty last year. Well, not, not economic development. Oh, not economic development, no. So you are a person. <coughs> so um, we'd like to actually show you uh, our Jay Foster bike, if, Larry, if you want to uh, show Yeah, well, that, that was a winter project. <coughs> um, but it's also what we do for businesses. Sure. And so what happens is when uh, someone uh, gets a sensory free bike, we have a lot of sponsors. So their shop name is on the front of the bicycle. So that's also another uh, way for us to get revenue and to also advertise for local businesses in town. So Larry created this beautiful bike for Foster's ice cream because they are one of our sponsors. Um, um, we have some uh, really unique bikes coming uh, too from the school system. Uh, the honors art class has four bikes, uh, four bike frames uh, and forks that they're going to paint as they so choose. And we're going to offer those to the general public as well. 
Um, and I also have Gal, who's a fine art, fine art student at Tufts University, who's doing two bikes too. So it's a fun thing. And it, again, it attracts riders. Uh, I can't tell you. We, we started off with six bikes, okay? And that was two years ago. And then we grew from 125 riders to 600 riders the second year, to 1,200 riders last year. We fully expect to have 2,000 riders this year. And most of them, like a 65% of them come from out of town. And a lot of them come from overseas and other states. So there's a lot of reasons why we should really start working on attracting more people to come to Simsbury as an economic, as a uh, ecological recreational destination. There's, there's a lot of potential. Logistically, how does it work if someone wanted to use the bike? Either they come out of town or <coughs> someone in town. Well, how does it logistically work? All right, so we have 50 bikes at 11 locations in six towns. And you don't have a bike dock like you find in New York City or Boston. You go into the, the small business itself and you pick out a bike out of the rack. They all have numbers on them. And there's both ladies' and men's frames. The ladies' bikes, for the most part, have a basket on the front. We also give helmets out and locks. And the bike, uh, you have to be 18 years of age or older. You, uh, each bike has a number. If you want bike number 42, you, you sign it out, uh, complete the waiver put down a $10 deposit, which is refundable to you when you bring the bike back after 24 hours. You can take the bike to the coast if you want to. As long as you bring it back within 24 hours, you can either donate to $10 or you get it back. Um, the season runs from May 1st uh, through October 31st. Um, most of the locations we have are along the trail system because they're friendly, easy, uh, flat. And we're getting people back into riding that haven't done it in years. And it's particularly fun if you have guests coming Okay, and you want to show them Simsbury. Great way to see it. They can run a bike and, and go out together. And also, too, just within the Farmington Valley, uh, we just did the Valley cleanup on Sunday, and that is th uh, 32.6 miles, and that goes all the way from Collinsville all the way up to Concavon Road. So we do have cyclists that get on uh, their bicycle and ride through Simsbury, <coughs> through Granby, through Avon, through Farmington. So they come this way as well. So do, you, do you have to bring the bike back to the same spot? or to the same spot. Otherwise, you get terrible imbalances, and, and I have to go get them, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> well, I'm talking, I'm talking in general, the cyclists, right. not the, not, not the communities. <clears throat> no, 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 I'm but, just but, yeah. wondering, as you travel, can you leave it? Or be you because of my background in transportation, I've managed large fleets, not only of trucks, but also aircraft. <clears throat> so I, I run a free bike like I would a business, a transportation business. Every bike has a record. Every time somebody works on it, they record what they did. Once a week, the bikes are inspected at every location uh, to make sure they're mechanically okay, pump up the tires, lubricate them if necessary, replace them if they need replacement. We always keep spares around. Um, <clears throat> we also have a fleet of our own bikes um, at the shop, too. We call house bikes that we let friends use. Um, so we have about 70 bikes altogether. Some of them are antiques, um, so it's, it's fun. I enjoy it, but uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's straightforward way to get a bike. Again, you have to be 18 years of age or older. Great. Um, One question. It's a very impressive statistics of how you started with 50 people signing up, and within two years got potentially to 2,000. On a given weekend, you have, what, 50 bikes? We have 50 bikes. Are they... Just for a typical weekend, are they all rented, so to speak, rented out? Or uh, a, a busy week for us would be 80 rentals. Okay, <clears throat> um, but it's growing. Um, they just put in some trail count. The uh, Farmington Valley Trails Council recently put in three counters: one in Canton, one in Suffield, and one down in Farmington uh, next to Red Oak Hill Road. And they've been in existence since the end of May, early June last year. And from that period of time, from June until January, there were 252,000 people who were on the trail. And that's only for half a year. We don't know what we have in Simsbury. We want to get our own counter, but obviously we don't have any funds to do that. Uh, Simsbury Free Bikes is a 501c3 not for profit, and our committee doesn't have any budget either. <clears throat> we would love to be able to put in a, a counter, and we've already uh, approached Ensign Bickford, okay, because they have a monitoring uh, system 24 hours, you know, 
365. So one of them got stolen years ago. It was in Weetog, and the Trails Council doesn't want to fund one again. So we're looking for sponsorships. Okay, somebody you know who wants to uh, spend a few thousand dollars to put in a trail uh, counter. It's important, <clears throat> particularly when we go for grants. We have to show evidence of usage, and we don't have that. But just, just as an example, like I said, those three locations, 252,000 people, and 119,000 people were up in Suffield, okay? So we have people coming from Massachusetts down into Sims right now all the time. Do you, are you looking to add bikes? If you had- We'll add bikes. 100% uh, more, could you- uh, I don't know any... if, I, if I can handle any more bikes. Uh, right now, I've been approached by West Hartford and New Britain yeah. to expand there. And I just can't, we just can't do it. I just don't have the physical assets. Assuming you assets. have a staff. The staff is Staff, you know, I'm willing to help them out yeah. uh, every way I can except with, with assets. Um, we're also, uh, I'm on a committee um, at the state level where we're looking at uh, getting bike share programs along the I-91, I-84 corridor. Um, right now there's a feasibility study on that. But... Uh, our valley is not going to be included, uh, so we really have to go go to lump. Um, but we kind of max out. Unfortunately, we're very very lucky that the Andreo family has given us a space behind Andy's that we get for a dollar a year, and we have 1,100 square feet there. We have a shop, and um, <clears throat> that's where we do all our work. It's a great deal. Um, and we do have a shop night every Thursday night, as a matter of fact, between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. if you ever want to come down. Right. You're also all invited to, uh, to go to our, any one of our meetings that we have every third Thursday uh, of the month. The committee meets at the library. And uh, you can see what we, we, we try to do. Yes, we'd love you to come and visit the shop. Uh, when uh, you, the number of uh, bicyclists going through, you mentioned 252, whatever number it is, are... Are they mostly the avid bike riders that are going, you know, 50 miles no, straight actually, through? No, most or, of the avid. What are they? What, what's a, a typical bike ride of these people on here? And how often are they stopping, having lunch? I, I, I'm trying we, to get. We don't know. You, we, okay, we don't you don't. Have the and that's a good question too, um, because on our, our our silver application, we have to do a survey. And today, actually, I'm going to ask everyone to fill out a, a very small benchmark study. It'll take you less than five minutes, and that'll help us with our, uh, our larger survey. So we really don't have that kind of data yet. We're trying we're to get some benchmark information. Data. So this will help us get started with our this larger is survey. Number we can be because the, the whole concept that you're presenting to us is an economic benefit to the town. Mm -hmm. yep, what is the... the the typical uh, 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 bike style or bike ride style. Do they come? Do they stop? Do they go have lunch? Do w what type of uh, rider is? Or are they just blasting through, trying it's to get as many miles number. as they can? Because that obviously day affects day what you, you provide in this area to make them stop. You know, again, to, we, you know, to we, get them off. We can tell you what we know through free bike. We can tell you what we know through the Trails Council. Again, we know that 200,000 people use the trails from uh, Collinsville up to Congamon. Um, we can tell you, you know, from our small study from Seafair Free Bike um, that they're casual riders. We even have cyclists who are in their 80s who come back on a regular basis. So these are also people that they get out and they, they cycle on a casual basis. But I just don't have those numbers. Because yeah. that's right the now. key component of what, right. what what will make them stop here. Right. What, what, we what added do some we questions. provide to do that? Well, we added some questions to our waiver this year to get more specific information. Yes. Um, and one of, that I wanted to see done is, is where did you go on your bike? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's important. Okay. Because if we can channel that, okay, mm -hmm. we, we know what businesses um, are frequented. And I can tell you based on my experiences where a lot of bicyclists hang out and that's uh, have lunch. And that's uh, up in uh, Southwick at Red Riding Hood's Basket. They owe their existence to bicyclists. Uh, I, where I'm going after this meeting will be uh, down in Collinsville at LaSalle's Market to have a slice of pizza. I'm going to ride down there later. 
uh, again, that's another business that owes its existence to buy cyclists or, or people who like that type of lifestyle. There are many. Um, and, and then Pepper <coughs> Mill, who just opened up last summer in Granby, their business is booming in the summer with cyclists. You go up there, and there are not only just well, see, three that's, bikes. That's, that's what I'm talking about, that, so. that stopping at these right. places. But we haven't been able to track that yet. Uh, we haven't. We really thought about demographic information this this year. It just came to me when I did that study on men versus women for our bicycles. And that's the first time we ever even considered uh, gathering data like that. Uh, but we did, and I and, and Jim did the study this winter. Uh, we broke it down to age groups and communities and everything we could possibly you know, pull from the, the waiver information that we have, which wasn't a hell of a lot. But we know. Um, we know the more information that we find out about these folks, the better it's going to be for us all. I think we look forward to working with you in the future in whatever way, so we hope you come back. You'll be on our websites when we get the websites up and running. Oh. Uh, and look forward to uh, making it a more more business-friendly, bike-friendly community. Yes, we hope so. And thank you. And thank you. Right. Can you thank get you. that presentation emailed out to um, commissioners, if possible? Um, I can do that. There's been some trouble loading it, but I'll do my best. I know Mary did finally get it, but I'll be happy to do that. Is it a PowerPoint or something? It's, we had, we, it was so big we ended up doing PDF. Okay. So I'll also do that. Um, Thank I'll you. I'll do that. I can get all of your emails on, online. Okay. And I also think here, this is our Simsbury Free Bike Business Card. Um, I don't know if you have any questions at all. If you want us to send you anything, you can email us. Um, this is a card that we have written for all of our customers. Our email is on here. And here also is our calendar uh, for bike month. Um, this is just a draft. We do have more to add on. I just didn't have time to, uh, uh, to update it. And we also have a new website that we're working on. So we just haven't quite launched it yet. We're also on Facebook. We have a great, great uh, site there that uh, Patty Jacobus uh, put together. Patty used to be the director of marketing for Lockhart Corporation, so she's really, really uh, quite good at uh, those sorts of things. She's we appeared in a lot of different publications, and, and we actually appeared in the uh, Bicyclist Magazine, which is the uh, bicycle magazine for the uh, Living American Bicyclist here just in this month's edition. So it's a, a full page, uh, actually more, uh, alongside San Francisco, California. So the people I've read about all over the country get a lot of uh, the press out of that. So please like us on Facebook and uh, there's a lot of one specific information to there in there too about bike cycling. Um, it's not just about century free bike stuff by cycling. Thank general. you very much. All right, moving along, uh, we're running a little short on time, so we're going to do a very quick update on where we are on our website. Um, Mark and I met, um, Carol and met last week for a couple of hours um, to take a look at templates and the structure of it. So. Um, I think we're looking to do some sort of presentation to the task force um, late May. Um, so we are working on that, um, and that's and, where we're at. And we're hoping to get eventually access to the tools from virtual town hall um, for a small sum of money. And as soon as we have that, we can start manipulating their templates to put it in an order and a usability that we like. So we'll let you know on that. Contact Stephanie, who is, our, who is our communications person, and she may be able to assist you with that. Okay. Um, the uh, EDC is looking to work more closely with culture, parks, and recreation, looking at what they do, the golf course, and the other facilities, so that we look at that as an economic driver. And we have not coordinated in the past, but we think going forward we'd like to do that. Jerry Wetchen from Culture, Parks, and Recreation will be our liaison uh, to EDC. And we'd like to begin to raise some ideas about how we can more closely coordinate to make sure that Culture, Parks, and Recreation becomes a bigger part of the economic driver in terms of what it offers in terms of recreation, hiking and biking, that kind of stuff. And Jerry Toner is here also who heads up for the town culture, parks and recreation. So this is open for discussion in terms of um, what we can do, but Jerry is here and I think you had a couple of ideas you wanted to throw out. 
Yeah, one, one of the things in terms of your marketing study pointed out that education and recreation are the town strengths. And yeah, I, I just was doing a little bit of research the other day. You know, you just go out to Wikipedia or, or anything else, and, and there's there's tremendous amounts of information that are out there. That I think when you get your uh, website up and going, uh, that we we could link. You know. Uh, and, and it's just not parks and rec only, but the culture part is, is, is an important thing. But since we have, what, 38% of the town's land is open space or parks, uh, we have uh, four state parks in, in town. Uh, there's only five state parks in Hartford County. Four of them are in Sensor. Uh Jerry's uh, program with, with all the kids and everything, you know, we run 750 adult and children's programs during the year. But I, I think in terms of why we've achieved the recognition in Money Magazine or anything else is a function of what we offer our residents in terms of leisure activities and the quality of life. Uh, and, and I think that is an attractive feature for the town when you're trying to attract businesses. You know, not only the business, but their employees. Uh, these are things that we need to market. Uh, find it interesting, you know, with, with the, the, uh, the biking, the fact that we have that much uh, space. Uh, we need to coordinate a little bit better as culture parks and rec with the other commissions, bicycle friendly community. This is wonderful. Uh, how can we help you market that? What can we do? Uh, one of Jerry's problems in Parks and Rec is, is our budget is, for Parks and Rec compared to other towns is so minuscule. Uh, we just did something uh, recently for the Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen. Uh, Glastonbury spends $98 per capita on Parks and Recreation. The town of Simsbury spends $29 per capita. Uh, our library uh, you know, they, they did a presentation. It's $1.23 per person per week in tax dollars for the library. It's 56 cents per capita per week for Parks and Rec and 16 cents per week per capita for Simsbury Farms. So, you know, part of the economic development, if we're going to take advantage of what we have, then we have to start looking at uh, investments in those assets as well. Jerry, um, in the past, as with the percent of the budget that went to culture, parks, and recs, on average, was it higher or lower compared to today? Oh, it's higher. It was higher. Substantially higher or slightly wait, higher? Wait, it was higher? Or it was is higher before, yeah. Okay, so yeah. it's gone down. Yes. Okay. And, and probably more, probably most uh, visibly in the park and facility maintenance area. That's where it's really been good. We've lost, you know, over. I'm going to say in the last 20, 25 years, our maintenance staff is, <coughs> is about 60% of it, what it was, um, while the facilities that we've absorbed, Greenway, you know, being one of them that's just a tremendous asset, our ability and our resources have gone the other way. So it's, it's but, I mean, it's not uncommon. I mean, we're not unlike any other department. We're, you know, we're stretched more thin, but as Jerry pointed out, other towns, Glastonbury, South Windsor, and others seem to have been able to keep up with that, um, whereas we have not. And I think going back to that marketing study, which clearly points out that you look at your arts, your entertainment, and your recreation are the strongest suits that we have in this town, you'd have to look at these assets and ask the question, why isn't the town more strongly supporting them um, as, as an economic driver and one that is clearly been pointing out is our strongest you know, suit that we really have to play? Well, I, uh, overall, I, I think the town has good facilities uh, but I will take the pessimistic approach I think we talk a really good game but when you go and you look at some of these fields as you know I've been a big proponent of that for years and years where you talk about what you just mentioned that the amount of money we spend on parks and uh, culture and recreation uh, is a quarter of what a town similar to us that uh, we always seem to be compared to in one way shape or form we're spending a quarter so so we talk a really good game but when you walk some of these fields and you look at uh, uh, 
from a spring sport perspective at the high school, you have everybody using one field because you can't even get on. We have one athletic field that's of a, a nature that you can use in early spring and uh, the others are barely now just starting to be used. And when you go to those other ones, frankly, I think some are unsafe. And I've said it before, I, I can walk those now right now and say, this is what the town of Sinsbury provides and they're used, they're reused, they're used a lot and they're worn by mid spring. And we say we're very uh, park friendly and it's not a knock on Jerry. And I, I believe more funding would change that uh, incredibly. And I do believe there is a connection between us and Culture Parks and Rec. And, and I don't know where, from a budgetary standpoint, what was provided to, or, or sought, I would say, uh, to increase it. Was there some effort to get more money in some areas from Culture Parks and Rec? Because w w we can help. One of the, the connections is we can, if we feel that it's going to help some economic driver in some fashion, we can help support that through the budgetary process or at least speak on it and, and provide letters and support, which we've done in the past in other areas. So I don't, I don't know where you stand from seeking those monies, trying to increase it. Uh, if you're even trying, not trying, it's falling on deaf ears. Uh, but, I, but I agree, there's a, uh, there's a lot that I think needs to be done to get to the level of other towns that are putting emphasis on those things, whether it be biking, athletic fields, and more importantly, uh, uh, walking trails, and in the cultural aspect of it, uh, I think that gets put to the side. So I don't know where you, you stand. Just there. as an aside, Lou, and, you know, because I, I work very actively within the golf course, and uh, one of the things uh, that we saw is you know, our rounds going down, 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 and particularly because we have less and less resident golfers. So what do you have to do to attract from out of town? We're doing enhancements to the golf course to the point where we were at about, I want to say, 28% of our users were non-residents. We're now up to 39% because we're actively trying to market a product and with a significant amount of competition why they should come here. Uh, so you, you have to create a reason for them, because we're out of the way, to come an extra 15, 20 minutes. Uh, so these are the projects we've got a five-year business plan to continue to enhance, enhance the golf course, do things to generate uh, more play, more revenue. Uh, and, and I think you know, part of, as you mentioned, economic development is we have to invest some money to make it more attractive for people to use it. Is, what's the budget uh, request? What's your budget this year for Cultural Parks and Rec? Well, we're spawning, we're in two, it's kind of two separate pieces. One is a special revenue fund, which was formed um, primarily to operate and maintain Century Farms along with all our other programs. Basically, it's, it's everything exclusive of park and open space maintenance. And, and that's right now about 1. Point, I'm going to say 1.9 million. Um, more importantly, it's the parks and maintenance budget that is very, very small. Park and maintenance budget is the one that, again, that's the one I was referring to earlier, that's really a percentage of what it once was in terms of Is that terms of the field, fields? I'm sorry? That would be part of the it field? It would, yeah. yeah. And, and I should also mention that we, we um, have a responsibility for the uh, uh, maintenance of the uh, Board of Ed fields. Um, so that we have, uh, and actually we're at about <coughs> close to 20 years of that agreement, um, Board of Ed funds two of our full-time maintainers. We only have seven. Two of those are funded by the Board of Ed um, in, in recognition of, you know, basically the proportion of fields that we have, Board of Ed fields versus town fields. Um, do they just yeah, fund your staff or do they help support the equipment both, to use? Well, they do. They primarily, they, they fund two full-timers. They fund uh, operational expenses. Um, not so much on the equipment side, and we're trying to work towards a, you know, an agreement on that that's a little more equitable than it is now. <clears throat> that being said, I think they've been, you know, overall it has worked well, and I think given where the Board of Ed Fields were 20 years ago to where they are now, I think they want to keep that agreement in place, um, and it's, I think it's worked out well for both. You know, as Lou said, you've got improved youth groups and 
high school interscholastic groups are using the same field, so it, it there's you know it, it is working well. But you know we right now we have 40 athletic fields uh, in town that we actively maintain, and with seven maintainers. So I mean you can you know get a field. Um, Glastonbury has twice that number. Um, similar you know similar towns, similar uh, facilities. Um, so it, it's it's a challenge. There have been other things that have played into it too in terms of the ability. Uh, you may be familiar with the legislation at the state now uh, that's limited pesticide use on fields. It's now up to K through eight. There's a bill going in front of, um, uh, I believe, the House that will extend that through high school. That will have a, that's had a dramatic effect on the Henry James fields, and, and you know both from a, a, a safety standpoint, uh, our ability to maintain these fields is is severely hampered. Um, so that that's been a challenge as well. Um, but just in, in term, that that the general fund piece of the budget is the one that has taken yeah. the. the and that, what is that? What is that? That's seven hundred ninety-one thousand. Seven ninety, right? Percentage w percentage wise, how has that gone up or down? Oh, it's flat. Or down. It's flat for about flat to down for about ten years. Can <coughs> I ask one question, yeah. Jerry? Um, what percentage of your budget goes into sensory farms as opposed to the rest of the town? Well, the special revenue fund is about 1.9 million. Although that's that's somewhat deceiving it's because all that also fees. includes all our <clears throat> all our programs as well. It includes seven full-time staff, it includes our entire golf maintenance operation. <clears throat> so it's it's not a, an apples to apples measurement really. Um, it, it's uh, you've almost got to take it piece by piece to try and you know, can't really say. It's, it's X amount of dollars goes into right. maintaining the golf course. That that we're able to worry about. <clears throat> does the money you take in on the golf course flush back through your budget, or does that go back into the general it fund? How does that work? It stays in the special revenue fund. Uh, special revenue fund includes the golf course as well as all of Simsbury Farms, the rink, the pools, the overall, all the maintenance of of the farms, as well as all the programs that we run uh, it, and the administration. Does it run in the black or the red? It, it's been um, it's been in the red. It's been in the red, but it's it's a lot of it is how costs are allocated as well, and that's what there's it's a, a committee right now that is looking at that. The best way to try and do you think um, the uh, um, staff and equipment use used for the board of ed fields is a is equitable right now, or has time? Have the times changed where that really is is an area that has to to change? Because a lot of the fields are on board of ed property, and, right. and are, are they providing the right amount? And staffing and operating costs, Lou. I would say yes. Equipment, no. And that's where we need to make it more equitable. Do we have user fees for youth sports teams yes, to we use do. our field? Yeah, we've actually we've got a field use policy that's been in effect now. We're in our second year that all the youth sports groups are uh, uh, are involved in. They, they charge a per, per participant charge. It goes into a dedicated fund. We use that fund for, you know, field, strictly for field maintenance mm -hmm. uh, supplies and, um, you know, regular costs, not capital improvements. Typically not equipment or staff, but just operating costs. Do you know if our user fees are in line with like Glastonbury's user fees? They fee? are. Yes, they are. Yeah. One of the things, uh, let me just expand a little bit because of uh, the study. In terms of the general fund budget, okay, Glastonbury's 3.3 .3 million, Sim uh, Simsbury is 791,000. Virtually the same amount of open space, same amount of fields maintained. You got to look at Simsbury Farms separately because that runs under its own. So you're market. taking Simsbury Farms out. out. The rest. Rest. <coughs> Mark and rack. And is that the same size in terms of uh, yeah, number the of fields has versus? You mentioned city. the number of fields that you you have to maintain, like 40. 40. And you said the Glastonbury has twice as many. No, no. They have the same amount of fields. Oh, so okay. Well, same. They have board of ed. They have the yeah. board of ed fields too. They're up around 50 or 55 fields. Okay. So with twice the, they have, uh, we have seven. Okay, I misunderstood. I Thank you. Have 15. Yeah. 
So you have twice as many people with a yeah. certain small yeah. percentage greater yeah. field use. When Glastonbury did those improvements to their fields, um, did they bond all? Of, I mean, how did they fund those improvements? No, I'm not. I'm not sure. When Glastonbury did their like their field, you know, their large <coughs> project over there where they've got all the soccer fields and lacrosse fields and the baseball. I, I don't know. I would guess they probably bonded. What's the mill rate in Glastonbury compared to Sunsbury? It's under 30, I think. Under 30? Yeah, well, they have commercial development. Uh -huh. So in a, in a perfect world, looking at this budget of 790, what, what, would, what would be a, a better budget or a, a more adequate budget to be able to maintain the fields to the standard that other towns maintain them? Well, you know, I, I would go back to, uh, you know, I, I think we'd all like to go back you know, 15 and 20 years to, the, you know, the, the, the I'll vote for that. Then. It's a different, obviously, it's, it's a different economy and there are different challenges. You know, we understand it. Um, you know, I, I, I have the conversation with Lisa once and I'll say, you know, we, we've cut, we never say no. And, and the expectation level is still there. Um, and we've got, uh, you know, we've got great volunteer groups that, that help us. You know, we're very fortunate there. But, um, you know, we're, it's, it's uh, you know, when you throw in the 22 acres of, 2200 acres of open space, uh, the Greenway, been wonderful. We kid around when that was first put in. It was it was dubbed as maintenance free, and you know we, we know it's, it's not. It's a tremendous resource, but with it comes a maintenance responsibility and, and resources that have to be dedicated to it. That's where we have we have not kept up. So there seems to be a mismatch between what the town and residents want and enjoy, and what we as a town allocate to maintaining those assets to a level that is considered to be adequate or good. We talk a good game. Yeah. We talk a good game. Does Glastonbury fund any of their <coughs> fields with business sponsorship for maintenance? I'm not aware. I know they do have a, we were actually one of the first ones um, to put in a field use policy, and although on a, we just formalized it uh, two years ago. We did it about 20 years ago, actually, when, when budgets were starting in the early 90s, when budgets were starting to get cut, we went to the groups and said, you know, if you want these fields maintained the way you've been used to, we need your contribution. And they all participated. Um, you know, at the time, when I talked to other towns, they just said, you know, as a matter of fact, my counterpart in Glastonbury said, if I ever propose that, they'd run me out of town. And when I went back to him two years ago, I said, you know, do you have anything on this? He sent me a three-page spreadsheet on what they're doing. So they've obviously everyone has changed. It's not, you know, it's it's something that we've all had to do. So I, I mean, I'd like this commission to think about and uh, how we can more effectively work with Culture Parks and Recs to once again look at what they're telling us our best assets are and how to both promote those and how. To <coughs> finance them so that uh, you know the marketing study that we have actually comes to reality in terms of the resources we allocate to our strongest suit. Any uh, questions? I'm sorry for Diane Moody. Could I ask her a quick question? <coughs> sure. When, when the bicycling started to gain some real pizzazz, if you will, in the town, Steve Mitchell was very active in it. Oh. And I haven't heard his name mentioned here at all. Is he oh, still involved? Oh, he's very, he's sure. very involved. There's a lot that we couldn't do without Steve Mitchell. Um, there's, um, he was responsible for hosting a uh, league of American bicyclists, oh, yeah. uh, the uh, LCI program that's happening April 17th through the 19th. Uh, I will send you all an invitation to the reception. So, um, and there was an awesome article on him. Uh, in uh, Valley Life, I think. Uh, but Steve, Steve really does a lot. So he's still deeply involved. Um, he serves on the he serves on the bike. He, he serves on our committee. Um, I talk to him all the time. So we, yeah, and he's on tourism. Yeah, we there's a lot that would not be done without Steve Mitchell. So he really is. But he's probably I was, more involved now than he ever has been. But, right. but more so with the East Coast Greenway. Okay, which is going to run from Cali, Maine to Key West. He's very much involved. He's on the board of directors of that organization. So he's kind of expanded up beyond Simsbury uh, and he's done a great job. Promoted, huh? Yeah. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, what, what, we're running out of time. Just very briefly, uh, we have updates for planning, and uh, we're not going to get to the GIS, the value of the GIS system today. But I, what I'd like to do before that is for to consider, and in the next meeting, if we had a GIS system and all the different departments in town used it, how much would we have in labor savings if we use the GIS system as opposed to not having it today. But on updates, Hiram, do you have any updates on? Sure, I was going to do a GIS. Um, just wanted to let you know, and I'll save that GIS thing for next time. I've got a bunch of information on that. We had a meeting this week and we talk to you about that. The IT committee, I believe, is working on, on some things, and, and we need to coordinate with them to talk about that as well. Um, Powder Forest PAD, which this group recommended uh, to the Zoning Commission be approved, was approved. Um, so that'll have a commercial, the senior living component, and a, a residential component to it. So that Powder Forest is uh, moving forward. I got yesterday a copy of the final site plans for the Big Y, and so that's moving forward. Well, what does that mean? That means that they dropped off their final plans for our review to make sure that they comply with the approval they have. have they closed? I have no idea. We would never be involved in that anyway, so I couldn't answer that question. I happen to know the answer in this case. The answer is no, but typically we don't know that information. The only reason I do know is because there's been this back and forth with the easement agreement, and, um, and that's they're still working on that. But what the delivery of the plans means is that they're ready to move forward. The plans that they've submitted are ready to move forward to the building department for issuance of the permit. So that'll probably be there sometime next week. How about the Hartford? You going to talk about that? Sure. The code for the Hartford is done. Uh, the, um, we had it done last week. The uh, Hartford is doing its final review of the code to see whether they approve it or not. It's ready to move forward to the uh, land use commissions for their adoption. And we hope that they'll adopt it sometime soon. So as soon as the Hartford lets me know that they're happy with the code, we're ready to move forward. Do they have any nibbles from... Uh I guess it's Ellis. I guess it's CBRE. Yeah. yeah. The uh, realtors are the only ones that could tell you that. I can tell you that they've shown it to a number of people. They've talked about a number of different components to it. There's some residential people that are interested in part of it. There's some other business people that are interested in another part of it as well. The specific clients, they don't tell us. They, I, I don't know that. We'll get an update from them probably within the next week or so because the Hartford, the uh, Hartford Land Use Subcommittee, and the rest of the land use committees will all know that as soon as that code goes to public hearing, probably within a week or so. The, the, uh, the state, because I think we had some people there from the State Department of Economic Development. Correct. With, with the latest announcement that the governor has acquired, one way or the other, the two big Pfizer buildings down in London, are there, are there any tentacles out for them perhaps doing the same here in the Hatford? Yeah. I. I um, a couple of months ago, actually, there was a proposal to establish um, manufacturing hubs in, the, in the different parts of the state, and you know, I suggested to the first selectman that we offer to become part of one in the Farmington Valley. It's the same type of thing that they're doing at the Pfizer Pfizer Complex. Um, I haven't gotten any feedback from the ECD yet or the first selectman as to whether the governor is willing to do that, but I did. Sorry. I did talk. About it. I did talk to some of the DECD people, and they're looking into it right now as to whether that would be part of it. So if that complex, for example, could become part of the Jackson Labs complex, that there would be some synergies there. So Jackson Labs and Farmington, the Yukon Medical Center, uh, could also become part of that whole manufacturing hub. So that's one aspect that we're working but on. But that would take it off the tax roll if it did that, right? No, not necessarily. No, no, it wouldn't no. be, would be a Yukon. No. We threw the tax yeah, no, not at all. Good. But I think that's the guts of it for the town. Yeah, that's right. And even and even if, and this is one thing, even if uh, a, a university or a college or, or some school were to come in and buy the property, there are ways that we can still get the same amount of taxes uh, from that proposition <coughs> by putting an amount of money in fee of rule of taxes, for example. Yeah. That can yeah. Be, and so we're looking into that as well. Sure. Like Ethel Walker should be paying a fee in lieu of taxes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Westminster does. Pardon? And Westminster does. Westminster does. Yes. But, you know, I see in the budget we got another <coughs> million three going to Ethel Walker. They contribute zip to this town. 
I hope that goes on record. I think it's a disgrace. <laughs> an absolute disgrace. I'm oh, sorry. No, that's okay. A um, bunch of other stuff. I, I won't take your time with that. Okay, we'll put GIS on the, the agenda for next time to have a more vigorous discussion. You can update us on what's going on there. Okay, with no other questions, we have a motion for adjournment. So move. So move. In favor? Thank you right. very much. Larry? Yeah. Is he second? <coughs> you want these little surveys? Yeah, we'll collect our survey. Yeah.